Good afternoon, everybody. Kind of happy to see so many people here on a rather warm and nice autumn day. Um, <clears throat> it's kind of interesting, it was mentioned in the previous presentation, one of the major problems in that science is reproducibility because it happens to be one of the big problems we have today in terms of especially internet service development. I'm going to step a few years back, well, a few 10 years back to where Unix, which is what serves most of internet services today, started. In the mid-60s, a guy called Ken Thompson was working on the Multics operating system at Bell Labs. One of his side projects was to create a game called Space Travel, and when Bell Labs decided to stop working on the Multics project. He wanted to keep on playing his game, so he found an old PDP-7 microcomputer, and he re-implemented his game on it. The tools, the environment he made, ended up becoming the starting point of the Unix operating system. So funny enough, what powers most of the internet today literally started off as this side hobby project to make a half a million dollar video console. <clears throat> now, Unix very quickly, the tools that was made here very quickly started getting popularity. It got its own projects as many individual things that gets popularity does. It started evolving, it started spreading out into other companies and when Ken Thompson joined um, Berkeley University in 1975 as a visiting professor. They started projects to build more tools around the Unix kernel. This became BSD, the Berkeley Software Distribution, which again led to the, uh, a large number of new Unix systems, public and commercial, being created over the next years. During the, the 80s, you literally got tens and tens of different Unix variations. Free, commercial, but it stayed mostly inside of research and academia. The hardware it ran on was very expensive. The typical workstation on your desk was like thirty, fifty thousand dollars upwards. The typical servers were millions, if not tens of millions of dollars. But maybe surprisingly for many today, these systems were actually very heavily automated, at least the good ones. Where I started my work in the early 90s, things were really, really well automated. I didn't have to do a lot of work to upgrade tens of machines or servers in theory. The problem was that these servers were generally so expensive that they were shared by many users. This made it difficult to upgrade and migrate and make sure that things kept on working. The setup evolved over many years, and as a result, it got very difficult to clean things up. You didn't know what the file belonged to. You didn't know who used the file. You couldn't effectively roll back anything. Gradually, you got this system that was tot totally impossible to reproduce when you wanted to upgrade it. Today, this is often referred to as snowflake. You make systems that are truly unique and nobody can reproduce it in any shape and form. This becomes a problem that we have dealt with for many years afterwards and it largely comes from the extremely high price this hardware had back in the 80s and 90s. Come early 90s, the Intel platform drew a huge reduction in cost to servers. Many of these commercial Unixes, or basically the BSD part especially, turned into free versions running on Intel. You had a guy in Finland, Linus Torvald, making his own kernel called Linux. Microsoft tried to join the game with the Windows NT distribution, becoming multi-user, but didn't really work tapping into this community. But in the end of the day, the dramatic cost reduction of hardware led to huge changes on the desktop. Suddenly people could have their own machines instead of sharing with hundreds of other people. It gave people a lot more freedom to do what they wanted to do. And the friction towards the admin team that you had to deal with before dramatically reduced. But on the server side, actually the step to Intel was a huge step backwards. 
In the original commercial Unixes, you had a tight integration between OS and hardware. This allowed us to do a lot of automation. It gave us a lot of security practices, which was very difficult to replicate into the low-cost Intel strategy. Every vendor had a different hardware stack. There was different tools to automate. Due to the reduction in price, different groups, individuals, could buy their own servers with their own spec and tell the admin team to run it. And the admin team had to deal with suddenly hundreds of different hardware configurations, which massively meant more work. This was not a good thing for automation, for driving things forward for, <laughs> faster forward. But by around 2000, some companies made huge improvements to this, largely driven by dot-com area. Massive scale automation, but with massive investment in internal tools that nobody else could use. <clears throat> so still this is the case today, but you have a situation where to get the server, usually people had to go share requests for an infra team, then they had five meetings to discuss architecture, then you need to figure out your budget, order, deliver, rack and stack, set up. Getting a new server was usually a three to six month process. And back in the 90s and early 2000s, surprisingly often getting a new server ended up being next year's budget. So no dynamics, it wasn't possible to move things fast, and it was largely an organizational process because you could actually have bought a bunch of servers already early 2000 and just had a pool to drag things out and install quickly. But a lot of mental barriers stopped us from doing that because no finance team want to have a stack of unused servers around. They want to wait until you actually need it. So <clears throat> high lead time for new hardware, large number of custom hardware variations, Ownership of hardware, hugging the hardware, people that don't want to share with anyone else, even though they only use 1% of the server, blocked efficient hardware use. We had some architectural problems in Unix, and the result of this was that you actually had a situation where many teams had massive friction between the people doing OS, service, servers, network, and facility, and the people trying to do applications. Some teams this worked fine, but in other teams, people gave up and they just outsourced the whole thing to someone else. That was reality. But something started changing. The, the, that friction compared to what was happening on the hardware side, where we suddenly hit the upper limit of how one CPU core could scale, physical limit, if you want the Transistor to switch fast, you need to increase voltage. If you increase it too much, you burn up the thing. So around 2004, scaling of CPUs ended up by adding more cores. Suddenly in one year, you double the performance, but the applications couldn't actually use two cores. So why not just break it up into two virtual machines? Virtualization was already getting good, actually. And add the fact that most services don't need high-spec servers. Today, the majority of servers in something like AWS are small instances. A report by an AWS management system provider called Second Watch back in 2014 revealed that 38% of instances in AWS is defined as small. How small is a small instance? Well, I ran some benchmark this week. You can see EC2 T small, 2,800 score on Geekbench. My iPhone X got 10,600. The majority of web servers and applications out there today from small companies actually run on those T2 smalls. So virtualization was all set up. No more server hogging. You successfully decoupled hardware from service. People didn't need to buy servers. They were happy getting a virtual machine instead. Provisioning time went down. The administ administrators was very happy because suddenly they could use one hardware config no matter what was configured on top of it. Everybody was happy. But the impact was <clears throat> coming over the next few years. By 2010, one server could easily handle maybe 30 to 50 small VMs. It was becoming standard to go from a configuration where you had many ser services per server to one service per VM. 
New tools made this e easy. You could automate the build of a VM. You could clone it. But the problem was that we didn't yet have practices where you went from cloning to lifecycle management. You clone, you set up your VM, and then you keep on modifying inside the VM for the rest of the lifetime. And again, you lose reproducibility. It didn't really help that public cloud came in and basically gave you an endless supply of VM. Uh, usually people didn't really care about budget. If they worked in big company, they just spun up VMs as crazy. It allowed development teams to bypass infrastructure and security teams. And I've had at least two public cloud vendors show me presentations where they actually recommend that. Hey, you have a slow infrastructure team. You don't need to talk to them. Just go directly to us. We give you your infrastructure. Big, nice organizational hack. It allowed development team to go faster, but it created a large chunk of problems in the process. It was not even cheap, but the fact that it was expensive actually made a lot of smaller teams automate. And you can see startups driving automation to get elasticity. And as part of that automation, you actually draw a lot of efficiency improvement on the human side. So in between all of this, you had to do something drastic because you were getting thousands of virtual machines that most companies could not maintain. And birth of a job title that may or may not exist happened, DevOps. DevOps is actually defined as an approach, not as a role or job title. The core of DevOps is kind of simple. You just, for what you do, how you develop software, you define a process, a tool chain. Planning, coding, building, testing, packaging, <coughs> releasing, monitoring after release, these are repetitive cycles. You repeat them for every update you do of your software, why not automate it and make it predictable? So all parts of the tool change should be automated as much as possible so it can be repeated. The core part here is actually as earlier, reproducibility. Humans involved in the process is not reproducible, that's why in the earlier presentation, you saw a robot redoing things again and again, because we humans are not very predictable. Automate your test as much as possible. Automate your operations as much as possible. Always build from a well-defined, predictable pipeline. But even more important, never change once you have built. If you want to change something, destroy, create again. You want to build the entire environment, not just an application, because you're going to build one time and then you're going to deploy again and again and again. This is a huge shift from where Unix came as a multi-user operating system shared by hundreds of people sometimes. Suddenly we are going very heavily in a direction where you build unique environments that only do one specific thing, but contain the whole environment and can be deployed again and again and again. It's a total shift from the original big vision of Unix from the 80s. <clears throat> this drives a lot of cool things. I'm personally a huge fan of what I like to call POC-driven development. Spend less time planning, get it out, start making things, test it, try it, learn, and rapidly improve. The ability to fork a private branch of your next project, deploy it and test it, it's a huge benefit for a lot of projects. Now, you can easily do that, and then you can merge it into your main software development branch, and you can keep on rolling this out in QA environment, in production, in one data center, five data centers, 10 data centers. The environment is the same every time because you package the whole environment into one application. Now, this is easier than it seems to be because people like to change things. <laughs> they just like to go in there and tweak around with things. So uh, a funny little thing happened. We got this second layer of virtualization called containers. And container makes it even faster to build things as part of the automated build process. It just fit into the abstraction of making immutable system. Build once and never change it again. So containers also give you 
much less performance over overhead, so you can easily run much more of them versus VMs. It removes the OS layer and share the same OS into many applications. And this is really taking on in the software industry. I think everybody knows it, but maybe some people don't really realize how much this is changing things. If you do something simple like Google Trend, and you type in the major container or virtualization orchestration software out there, you get this result. You can see that vSphere, the green line from VMware, it was the king of the hill back in 2013. It actually was at its peak around 2014, but it's declining since then. Kubernetes, which is the orchestration system for containers coming from Google, has exploded from around 2016. And is today getting more than twice the interest according to Google Trend versus the leading commercial virtualization software. The effect of this is huge. While you 10 years ago, it's totally standard, had three to six months lead time to deploy something new. You can today literally make a small deployment profile. This is not the way you have to do it, but it's just an example. I want 100 container instances. Each one is going to have four gigabyte memory, four cores, CentOS 7.4, and I want it to run my app 5.24. A few minutes later, you have that deployed if you have the hardware available. You just shaved off six months waiting time from your project. This is the norm for modern software development. But the technology side here is not really the most interesting things. Why are we doing this? It's now roughly, well, it's 18 years since I just started working in the internet industry. And what I have seen working, providing solutions to others or building solutions myself, is that anyone that does less than one to two releases a quarter usually degrade in terms of quality. It doesn't matter what you do. If you cannot improve more than two to three times or a couple of times a quarter, you degrade. If you can do more than three releases a quarter or three improvements a quarter, you have a chance to sort of improve. Inside the Rakuten today, the fastest improving service parts, I'm not talking about the whole service like Ichiba, but the part like top page or search page, etc. they usually drive between 20 and 30 A-B tests per quarter. And the automation with automated build, deploy, containerization, automated QA makes this quite easy from the development viewpoint. The problem is a lot of teams face more of a tech problem. They face an organizational problem. Because as we've been driving this forward, most organizations are not able to plan and approve fast enough for 20, 30 features to be released in a quarter. If you serialize them, you have about three days to plan, develop, QA, A-B test, and release if you stack them in work days throughout the quarter. That's a very, very aggressive process. <clears throat> so organization is a key part of driving faster deployment. For the first time, I think, in the history of Internet and Unix, we are in a situation where the environment can run faster than the processes. Earlier, the processes usually got slow, bureaucratic, because the environment didn't move faster. Right now, the situation is actually reversed for the teams that has implemented it. So there's a big discussion, how do you organize your teams to be able to realize that potential? Do you do cross-functional? It's heavily advocated by Facebook, Amazon, and others. Small teams that has all the layers needed and which have the authority to decide quickly and run. It works really great for smaller projects. But as always, a lot of small individual teams sometimes makes it harder to keep consistency horizontally. So people will still try to do some sort of matrix type organization. But standardization often slow things down. So it's a complex process. Where are you going with this? And the reality of most organizations in big companies is that you end up in some sort of Tetric-like structure. There is no clean horizontal or vertical. It's like boxes going in all that kind of direction. You're borrowing part of a QA team from here to there. This team don't have development team, but you have QA, you borrow something here. This guy left, you need to borrow. That's the reality of big companies. So 
The discussion is a little bit funny at times because it's always practical. You have to get the job done and you end up with Tetris in here. This is an example from a service on Rakuten. I'm not going to say which one. Actually, it's a service part, a major service part. Um, middle of 2016, we changed from a traditional process in terms of decision making, semi-automated deploy test process to something that was heavily automated, full CI deploy. More than 1,000 test cases has been built from anything from API to visual regression, actually more than 2,000. And within three months of driving a process change, we were able to go from two, three A-B tests a quarter to close to 20. Today, we are closer to 30. This is a conversion graph. You can see it was flat in the two years before this change, and it's been continuously improving in the two years later. This is the impact of testing, testing, testing very quickly. In the case you see on the right-hand side here, so 20, close to 30 A-B tests a quarter, actually about 50% of them fail. This is much higher than what was the case before. But you're still winning because in the end you're doing small improvement and it all adds up to something big. This is very difficult to actually tell people. It's clear proof here on how rapid, in, rapid interactive cycles of improvement keep on improving services. But you have to change mentality to make this happen. And most people don't like to write test cases. And very often, that's where it fails. <laughs> now, I am um, originally a distributed person. Uh, not a distributed person, a distributed system person. Most of my background comes from making systems that has thousands of servers in them. What I described here with fast, iterative development cycle don't really work everywhere. If you go in the lower layer of your tech stack, you cannot really build data centers in a rapid, iterative way. You need to plan them well in advance and execute. Storage systems, you don't want to gamble on stability. You want to test very carefully. You don't want to corrupt your data. So it's, again, a different cycle, a different speed. If you're doing web pages with very low risk, you can test new things all the time. You just have to make sure you don't completely break the thing. So there is no simple answer to how quickly a development cycle and a release cycle should be. It's always different cases. And the most important thing is to learn when to use the right approach where. Do you have to plan more? Can you go more agile and just try and do iterative improvement? You have to learn that these are different tools, different processes, and take it from there. So Linux environments, it's gone from being a half million dollar game console for private use, hobby project, multi-user, multi-service, very expensive shared computers. We have moved over to virtualization, packing things into individual containers. It's almost like MS-DOS, actually. And we are running those at a very individual scale where we can terminate and go forward as we need. The next challenge is for this, networking. Software-defined networking package network into the application, and it's going to be very fun forward to automate and test that in a rapid iterative cycle without breaking the whole data center. But I'm pretty sure we're going to do that over the next years. Thank you.